Dr. Nafisa Sikandari is a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in anxiety-based disorders. Having struggled with her own anxiety for most of her life, Dr. Sikandari is passionate about creating long-term control of anxiety for her patients and students through natural and holistic methods. In addition to her clinical practice, Dr. Sikandari is also an author, publisher, and course creator. Her latest course, Transforming Anxiety, is an online self-paced therapy-in-a-box model where she provides over six months' worth of therapeutic material that can be used to create long-term management of anxiety from the comfort and privacy of your home. So welcome, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. I'm excited. I, I think I shared with you when you interviewed me I'm a definitely a big believer in taking care of our mental health. I don't always have the best like language for it or toolbox, you know, for it, but you do. So I think it's perfect. Uh, and May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Is that correct? It is. So happy Mental Health Awareness Month. We're here giving it some support. I think the first question I want to ask you is just about anxiety. I have a friend, Trudy Scott, who you might know, who specializes in it as well. And, and she, she, she kind of scolds me when I say, uh, she doesn't like people to say, I'm just an anxious person. Because she's saying it's, it's, more, it's, it's a state more than a personality trait. So could you kind of just help define like, what is, what is anxiety? I look at it differently as far as this is the way for some of us, it's genetic. And the reason that I'm very familiar with it is because it is a genetic uh, problem that runs in my family. I, for a long time, I didn't think that I had anxiety because some family members expressed it differently. So there are people that show up differently, but uh, it's like, I look at it as a spectrum disorder where we're somewhere on that spectrum. Not all of us are extremely debilitated. I would consider myself more high functioning. Uh, where my brain gets stuck, my I, my brain overworks and overthinks. It's like I have an over anxious brain, and so um, it, and it is a state, I guess, because depending on uh, whether I've had enough sleep, whether I'm taking care of myself, whether um, I'm in the right frame of mind. I'm like, if I'm not, then I'm going to be more reactive and more anxious. But I'm more prone to anxiety than somebody that probably doesn't have those issues, doesn't have an over anxious part of their brain. And so it can show up so many different ways. Uh, anxiety is a huge word. It's, it's a huge, it's, there's so many different types under this umbrella. Um, so there's obsessive compulsive disorder that's under that same umbrella. There's social anxiety, there's uh, PTSD and phobias, and um, I can't even think of all of them right now, but there's a lot of different ones under that one um, umbrella. Uh, panic disorders. So for me personally, growing up, I had uh, debilitating social anxiety and, and it was very difficult at school. I would get really uh, mortified if somebody called on me and it really created a lot of limitations in my life. And I was, I was leave, living a life, <clears throat> excuse me, of fear. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then later on when I became a parent, I noticed, because obsessive compulsive disorder is definitely a part of my family. My grandfather was famous for it. Uh, but none of us are really diagnosed with mm. obsessive compulsive disorder. But my grandfather was very famous for his behavior. So I knew that that ran in my family, but I didn't have the typical symptoms that like my mom is very rigid with certain things. I wasn't like that. But when my daughter was born, I became very controlling and very worried and very uh, just freaked out over the littlest things. And of course, a lot of that comes with being a new parent, but it was too much. And mm. so I started looking into it and finally calling it anxiety where before all this time that I was I had social anxiety and I was living in fear I didn't know it was anxiety I just like I'm just nervous so mm. it can be different for different people did you get into the field kind of curiosity or your family history or your own you know fearfulness you were feeling what got you into this whole field the field of psychology or studying anxiety Psychology. Oh, okay. So psychology, I did become interested because like I said, in high school, I was so controlled by fear. I, I didn't know what psychology was. So I have a little background. I'm an immigrant. We immigrated to this country at the age of 10. And mm. so um, I wasn't an anxious 
I mean, I guess I was, but I wasn't debilitatingly shy before I came to this country. But once we came here, just looking different, being different, speaking a different language, having a thick accent, all of that really made me really, really shy. And so, but I also didn't know anything about psychology. So you would think a lot of kids are taking psychology in high school, but that wasn't an option for my high school. So I took it, a class in college for the first time. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is the answer to my prayers. And so that's when I started studying it. And, but I still didn't connect what I was struggling with to anxiety because I'm not a cl classic textbook definition of anxiety. Okay. And this is what makes me different as far as a lot of other therapists and that because of my own personal struggle, I understand it at a deeper level than just a textbook definition of it. Okay. So it seems like some of what you're describing is genetic. I want to hear more about that. And some of it was situational. Um, it makes me think to this, yeah, this last year we've had with COVID, where I think if we want to talk about mental health awareness, like mental health has really struggled. I have a friend who recently lost her dad and she was calling around to get a therapist and they were asking her, are you suicidal? If not, we can't take you. We don't have room. And I was like, wow, that is pretty crazy. Um, so I think it's created a lot of, um, you know, situational anxiety or, or depression, et cetera, for people. Um, so yeah, maybe you can just frame that for us. Like when, how do we kind of find the balance between what, what is our nature and what's, what's our nurture in our situation? Good question. I mean, the reason I'm so passionate about it right now, and I really am making a big deal about promoting it this year, especially last year, I did a whole summit for uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, nice. did a whole seven day summit where we talked about mental health and really educating people on how to take care of themselves because COVID was becoming a real thing. People were really, really struggling. And this year, I really want to focus on it as well, because because of the pandemic, this anxiety is not only is it already the number one disorder in the world, but it's going to get even worse globally because of the pandemic. So a lot of us maybe were genetically predisposed to it. But like you said, some, some other people are beginning to feel it more because of situational issues, because mm -hmm. of so much loss this year. So many people have lost family members. Uh, so much feeling, uh, the feeling of uncertainty and anxiety about the future and um, not knowing what's going to happen. And maybe it's even triggering some dormant feelings that they might have already had as far as like maybe they were on the lower end of the spectrum, but this is really pushing them over. Mm. Um, so it is something that we need to talk about and really prioritize because the sad thing is it's going to get worse if we don't do something about it. Okay. Well, yeah, this um there's lots I could ask you, but maybe we should move more into tools because, yeah, I think we all kind of know like this is the situation that's going on and it's different depending on your age group and your particular situation. Oh, another friend of mine, her daughter may start preschool and they were saying something like, what did they say to her that, um, I don't know, something like they're making the class sizes smaller or something because kids aren't socialized coming in and like, it was, I, it was just another one of those moments like, wow, life is really changing. And I think those developmental years, I hadn't really thought much about little kids because I'm not around little kids much, but a lot of my friends have teens and I have a preteen and it's really, yeah, it's been really hard on them because they're supposed to be forming social skills right now. And then they have like this huge gap of time where they're not, you know, maybe getting to practice that, that skill as much. So maybe if somebody's even trying to reintegrate into social situations is <laughs> one, one scenario post COVID, um, what are some, like, what are some ways we can manage? Let's just start with social anxiety. Cause you said that's one in the umbrella. Uh, what are some ways that you've managed it or taught your clients to manage it? Well, it's, it's not just one thing like people with over anxious brains don't like change and they don't like uncertainty. I mean, I guess we could say that's all of us, but for some people that having are on the a spectrum of anxiety, it's really, really difficult for them. And um, so making things as focusing on what you have control over is really, really important. I mean, COVID and the pandemic has completely changed the world. Everything that we were used to is changed now, right? Every, the way we interact with each other, the way we talk to each other, the way um, even the whole, we're so afraid of being physically in contact with each other because of social distancing. And I hate that they kept using that term social distancing instead of physical distancing. Like they mm. did teach us 
how to still engage with people without touching each other and spreading germs, right? Mm. We should change the word back to physical distancing if we want to be safe. Um, but when your question about being more social, the thing that I teach my patients is people with anxiety um, have a need for control, but it's really the illusion of control because really in life, we really have no control over a lot of things. And we need certainty to calm our anxiety, but we need to learn how to live with uncertainty. So really embracing that fact and understanding that life is uncertain and there's a lot we don't have control over. So focusing on the areas that you actually do have control over. So as far as myself, I pushed myself to go past the fears that my brain wanted to get stuck on, the irrational thoughts and beliefs, and put myself in those situations anyway, um, because my brain wanted to freak out and say, no, that's dangerous, but it's like, no, like I, an example is my little, I have a little kid that came in to see me the other day. He's like seven or eight and he has severe anxiety and he was struggling the same way, going back on the playground and socializing because he's been homeschooled all year. And so I've been teaching him about his little monster in his head, how that freaks out. Um, so he was approached by a kid and the kid said, come and play. And he's like, everything in my body kept telling me to say no, but I said yes anyway. Oh, so and great. So went and played on the playground and had a good time and noticed that that was okay. Cool, cool. So that's sort of like an inner dialogue tool. Um, I think you probably have a lot of different tools in your toolbox. So I don't know where you want to take it next, but yeah, I just like, would love to like just kind of learn more about the different ways you teach people. I know you had it for me when you interviewed me, a lot of great questions about health. So I, I know that you're well-rounded. So yeah, what are some other ways we can deal with this? Well, when my patients come in to see me, they're very surprised that I'm not focused on their fears or their thoughts necessarily initially. I'm more focused on their lifestyle and their gut health and their, mm. and their sleep and their um, how they're taking care of themselves, what time they're going to sleep, what are they having for breakfast? Um, are they taking any supplements or vitamins? And a few people were very surprised, like, I didn't even expect you to ask me these questions. Why are you focusing on that? But what people don't realize is when our gut is off, when our gut bacteria is off, we're going to be more anxious. So it's not just because the majority of our mm -hmm. neurochemicals are in our gut. 90% are found in our gut. And so when our gut is off, I look at them as my little soldiers that are working so hard for me every single day. And they're not only there to defend me against viruses and protect me uh, and build my immune system, but also they help me sleep. They help me feel more balanced and emotionally in control of myself during the day. They help me focus. Um, so when they're not releasing those feel good chemicals because there's a imbalance and the bad guys are in charge and running the show and the good guys can't do their job, then I'm going to feel more anxious. And so the first thing I have to tell my patients is you have to manage uh, just what you're eating and stopping the, the processed foods and eating mm. healthier food, starting your breakfast with a high protein, high fat, high fiber carb diet, uh, not carb necessarily, but you know, the complex vegetables and um, fibrous foods because that's gonna stabilize your blood sugar and help you be less reactive. Also, what time are you going to bed? A lot of people because of this pandemic are struggling because their, their routines have been completely shifted. They're going to bed really, really late. They're sleeping in late. Um, they're not in sync with their circadian rhythm that we're naturally wired to be in sync with. So that's affecting their, um, their mood and their ability to, to be less reactive. So those are just two that I really, really focus on. And I'm very religious about sleep. Like, you have to be asleep between 10 and two to get take advantage of that deep, deep sleep uh, that rests and repairs your body. Are people surprised when they come to you or they kind of know this is coming when they, before they schedule with you? A lot of them come to me because of my focus on all that and not on medication. So in all the years that I've been in practice, I've never had to refer anybody for medication. Oh, wow. And these, these strategies definitely, definitely work and they don't need to take medication. A lot of them that even are on medication end up getting off medication because they end up focusing on what matters instead of putting a Band-Aid on their symptoms. Mm. Yeah, and another thing that occurs to me when you say eat at regular times, sleep at regular times, is that, that aspect of certainty that you said you wanna kind of create or focus on. Um, I've just been reading this 
this book about heartbreak that's really good. I should refer it to you. And she's like, if you're really, you know, going through it, just at least, you know, make your bed, brush your teeth, comb your hair, like, and then you feel like you have some control on your day. Um, and she talks about physiologically changing your mood with exercise and stuff too. And I thought, well, yeah, it's like, just, you just kind of have to get back to these real basics. Um, and it's sort of what we do with children too, right? So that we can help control their moods. <laughs> it's like, we, okay, now it's nap time. Now it's lunchtime. And like they, they, when they have that structure, it seems to help them and it helped the whole family sort of just like have more balance, right? Yeah, we have to focus on what we have control over because like I said, there's a lot we can't control. So one of the other analogy I do use is like we have a little toddler living in our head. That little toddler, it's like if you've ever dealt with a toddler, they become very unreasonable about the dumbest things, right? Because they're toddlers, they don't have a lot of experience. They freak out about things and we don't freak out with them. We really shouldn't freak out with them. We don't believe everything that they're freaking out about. We try and ask, did they, are, are they freaking out because they didn't take a nap? Are they freaking out because maybe they're hungry? Are they freaking out because maybe they have a poopy diaper or they need to rest or they need a hug? But when it comes to us, we have that same little toddler freaking out inside our head, but we freak out with it. That's the problem. The more we freak out with it, the more control it has over us. Mm. It's like freaking out with a toddler. Let's say the toddler is in the, in the, in the grocery store and it really, really wants something. The minute you give that toddler what he wants because he had a tantrum, what does that toddler learn? Next time he wants something, have a tantrum, right? Oh, I see, yeah. Okay. We're teaching the little toddler the same thing in our brain. So we have to be calm to ourselves like we are with that little toddler. Okay, okay. Uh, so we're sleeping uh, on, on time, we're eating regularly. Are there any supplements you particularly like, just like basics or ones for anxiety? Well, there's a lot of different things that I recommend. I mean, like I said, I really focus on, on what's needed, but um, there's herbs that I recommend. There are um, essential oils that I recommend. There are supplements uh, at the root. I mean, at, not at the root, but at the basic level, a really good quality multivitamin. I am a fan of supplements. I know there are a lot of people that think that they're not, that they're a waste of money. Uh, but there are a lot that could be a waste of money depending on the quality. But if you're looking for good quality vitamins, a lot of them that are food based, made with food, sweetened with food and dyed with food, um, then that's going to give you the nutrients and put in the fill in the holes that you're missing from your diet. So good sup, a good multivitamin is important. A lot of us are magnesium deficient. Magnesium can really help us feel calm and help us get that sleep that we need. So taking it at night is really important. If you don't want to take a pill, you can take an Epsom salt bath and that'll detox you and put magnesium back in your body. There's magnesium sprays you can put all over your body. Um, what else? There are uh, essential oils that you can diffuse or put on your body to help you feel calm. Vitamin D deficiency, that's becoming a huge problem. And a lot of people are saying that that's affecting people's moods, depression and anxiety. Um, so making sure that that's doing a blood test and making sure that that's not low. Um, there are adaptogens that I recommend that are really calming for the body. There are teas like holy basil is one of my favorite teas that you can drink when you're feeling stressed or when you're feeling uh, anxious, drinking that to help you feel calmer as well. Is that the one that's the same as Tulsi tea? Okay. It is. Okay. Okay. And do you ever have people take straight uh, neurotransmitter supplements or you don't, it's not really your thing? Like taking GABA or taking whatever, you know, like straight ser serotonin kind of enhancement. So the best serotonin enhancement that I love, and it's very safe and natural, it's 5-HTP, which is the amino acid tryptophan. Tryptophan, um, you can take tryptophan, it just takes longer to work in your system, but it also, it also stays longer in your system as well. Um, but 5-HTP is already converted from tryptophan. Um, it's converted to 5-HTP. And then so within 20 minutes, it converts to serotonin in your brain. So the way mm -hmm. that I look at tryptophan or serotonin, 5-HTP um, is it's like a faucet. 
like you have your little brain in a, in a sink, you turn on the faucet. And then so all that is flooding your brain with serotonin. So for some people, the only side effect that I always warn people about is when they initially take it is uh, the first three to five days, they might notice a small stomach ache or a small headache. Uh, but if they give it, a, uh, if they continue to use it, like maybe start off with 50 milligrams um, once a day, maybe try it at night so that you're not noticing the stomach ache or the headache. After three to five days, that goes away. But with anything before I even, I mean, even though I've already mentioned it, I do really want to say focus. I mean, work with a professional when you're taking these things and now just take all these supplements on your own, because I don't know what kind of medications you're taking. I don't right. know what kind of issues you might have. So be, please be careful. Okay. Yeah. Especially if you're on like a mood, a mood drug, so to speak, right. That can be really comfortable. You should never... Yeah, you should never ever take 5-HTP if you're on an antidepressant. Okay, so clear. <laughs> that one's clear on that one. The others are maybe, that one's a never. Okay. Yeah, I was, something I always find interesting in my practice is why clients usually love supplements. They're always on like 20 supplements, but there are certain supplements they don't seem to trust or want to take as much, even if they're natural. And I find that hormone aids and sleep aids are the two things that they get worried about, like they're going to be addictive or they're not natural. But I think that getting a good night's sleep, um, influencing your mood, influencing your hormonal health is just so helpful for quality of life. So I, I it's just interesting to me. I don't know quite where that um, kind of trickled down from, but I think there seems to be a bit of a mistrust. Um, so people can take something like your course, I'm sure to learn more about it if they're kind of wondering, you know, are these things, you know, what's, what's, what is 5-HTP really, you know, get a better understanding of it. Oh, I go into all of this. Yeah. And my course trying to get as comprehensive a, a view of treating mental illness coming at it from every angle to make sure that people are getting, creating long-term results, because there's a lot of uh, band-aid approach, quick strategies available for people um, that you can Google online, but that stuff only works for that when you're on that spot on the moment, but it's not gonna create the long-term healing that you need. And um, looking at it from a comprehensive view can give you that long-term um, healing of, or control of anxiety. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll, we'll talk more about your resources in a minute, but I, people may wonder, do you see clients online or, or what's your story? <laughs> what are you allowed to do with your license? Yeah, right now I'm licensed in California and Arizona, so I'm only seeing people in those states. Um, uh, they haven't opened up our ability to, to see cross uh, state lines when we're not licensed in those states, but I am working with people online. I do video platforms where I'm seeing them individually. Uh, in fact, I'm moving my practice completely online at the end of July and closing my practice in, in the Phoenix area, so... Awesome. Congratulations. Okay. So that's two whole big populations you can serve. That's awesome. Trista asked a really great question, which is if, if someone is prone to anxiety, is it a given that you need to have no sugar, no caffeine? I wouldn't say it's a given, but you need to look at all the other areas in your life to see what's going on because the sugar, the caffeine can, for some people can definitely make anxiety worse. Um, but that's the caffeine from coffee. So for a lot of my patients, I had one patient recently who was literally feeling like he was having a heart attack, uh, but he thought it was panic. And it was because he was doing straight up uh, those espresso shots. And so he completely gave it up. He's on green tea and black tea now, and he's not having any issues. So coffee can make you feel that jittery sense of that that can be related to anxiety. But tea has theanine in it, which is an amino acid that calms that, that our system down, but gives us that mental alertness. So for some of my patients, I would even recommend doing green tea extract, which can have more caffeine than a cup of coffee. But because of the theanine, it doesn't have the same impact on anxiety as um, a cup of coffee. Sugar, um, I think we're, we can all do better having sugar in moderation, uh, but I don't, I don't believe in having absolutely no sugar or sweets, I guess. I mean, because I, I use dates as a sweetener. I use other alternate, I use monk fruit. I use other things that are sweet still, but I don't feel deprived that, I'm, that I have to have absolutely no sugar in my life. Yeah, I, I like that. I think that makes sense. Um, she's asking, is the green tea, green tea extract, do you mean a pill or a tea form? 
It's not a tea. A green tea extract can be a tincture where it could be like a little bottle that's liquid. Make sure it doesn't have alcohol because a lot of green tea uh, is extracted with alcohol base. But if it doesn't have alcohol, then you can try it with other things. Um, and then there's also, it comes in pill format as well. I like the, the tincture because you can control the dosage. So for some people, they might need like a couple of drops where other people might need half a drop or full. Where a pill, you get whatever is in there. So you're getting a little energy, but also a little calming. So it's sort of just a nice little mini reset <laughs> in your day, potentially. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's another thing I found with, especially when the pandemic was really first started and I was, you know, at home more than I ever had been. It was like, I wanted these little fun things to like modulate my day, <laughs> but you don't want them to be like too naughty where you're, yeah, you're having a panic attack or you gaining 15 pounds or whatever. But yeah, I think that's part of like the pleasure of life is just like little things. Right. But yeah, in moderation, it's interesting about the, the coffee. Um, I'm, I would definitely say I'm on the anxiety spectrum and an overthinker. I can't really do coffee at all. Um, I'll be like pouring sweat. I'm like just super wired, but I can have some tea. I do find that tea's a little hard on my stomach though. So I kind of want to try, tea does astringent your mucosa, which, and then again, is not the greatest for your gut, which is like, you do want a healthy gut. So uh, I notice it for myself. So maybe I'll try, try the extract, see if that makes a difference for me. Kind of interesting. So you mentioned essential oils briefly. I, I'm a big fan of essential oils. Do you have any favorites? Oh, there's so many, like you were talking about how some people are afraid of using uh, supplements or medication for sleep and for um, hormonal balance. Well, you don't have to take medication. You don't have to take supplements. You can diffuse oils. You can put oils in a roller ball and put it on the back oh. of your neck, on the bottom of your feet. There are so many amazing oils that are very safe that you can use. Uh, one of the ones that I love to diffuse in my office are citru citrus oils like lemon, tangerine, orange. Um, it makes us feel calm and happy. Uh, peppermint has been really great for people that were having anxiety attacks. It, it just has a cooling effect when you put it on the back of your neck. Uh, it's great for headaches. Um, it also, I have these little peppermint beadlets, or you can even put a mint in your mouth. It forces you to take a breath. So the whole goal um, of managing anxiety is just to focusing on our breath and grounding ourselves and calming ourselves and essential oils can do that. Just putting a couple of oil drops in your hands and just smelling it is also really good. So besides peppermint, I also like, um, there's the adaptive blend from doTERRA that is really, really good for mental health issues and also for attention. Serenity is also really good with the doTERRA. doTERRA. Uh, Balance is also another blend from doTERRA. These are all the things that, because um, I use doTERRA essential oils, but you can get other oils, but um, I'm really a fan of like the, the purity of doTERRA and the quality of doTERRA. So I know there are other oils that are cheaper, but be, be careful about what you're using, especially if you're using it on your skin, um, because it's all, in, we're inhaling it and we're absorbing it. And so if, if there's any solvents in the oils, if there's any additives in the oils, we're absorbing those as well. So be careful when you're using oils. Yeah. And if you want to, I'm a doTERRA person too, but if you want to avoid that business structure. Our friend Jody Cohen has vibrant blue oils are really high quality as well. And she's got a lot of cool blends. Um, yeah, awesome. So I know you have a podcast. Um, so I wanted just to share like other resources that people want to learn about anxiety. So if you could share your podcast or any other favorite ones you listen to or your favorite audiobooks, just so people can kind of get get into the space more. <laughs> So my pet, my podcast is uh, a mental health break um, with Dr. Sikandri, and it's uh, available on all the podcast platforms. And I try to educate people as much as I can about mental health and just making it an opportunity for you to focus on your mental health once a week and just talking about different topics. Like a couple of weeks ago, we talked about um, detoxing for better mental health with you. So that was a really good popular uh, episode that people be really benefited from. Um, I know Dr. Daniel Amen. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's a psychiatrist. Yeah, awesome. he's written yeah. many, many books. Um, one of them, one of his books is Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. And his understanding of mental illness really changed the way I see mental illness for myself and for my patients because he's right. I mean, he's like a lot of mental health professionals 
uh, we work with the brain, but we don't really look at the brain. And so he uses scans and he really can understand what's causing what and, and really understands about how ADHD affects us, what are, how, our, how we treat our brain affects our health and our mental health. So I like his books and he also has a podcast out. I just lately, I haven't had too much time since I started my podcast in January to actually <laughs> listen to podcasts, but I'm sure there's a lot of really good ones out there. But as far as books, one of my favorite, favorite books, and this isn't any book that, uh, you know, is a research heavy book. It's a book for children. Mm. It's called um, What to Do When Your Brain Gets Stuck. And I use that with my patients all the time. And I tell them it's for children, but it's really, because I, I, I work with children, but I, it's, it really helps the kids, but it really helps the parents understand what's going on with their children as well. So what to do when your brain gets stuck. And then also the other uh, books that this I can't remember the author right now, but the other uh, books that she's written in the series are What to Do When You Worry Too Much. And both of those really give you concrete examples of what anxiety looks like for, for us and what we can do about it. Oh, I love it. I needed those. <laughs> <Once again. laughs> um, okay. And then you have a webinar, I think, coming out and you've got this course. We can go to your website if, if that helps. Um, look at some of your resources, but you want to talk us through them while I pull up your site? Yeah, next Tuesday, I'm having a live free webinar for anybody that wants to join us and have a conversation about mental health. I'll be talking about the three steps you can take to transform your anxiety. And then I'll also be talking about my course, uh, which is a six week uh, course. I mean, it's a, it's self-paced. So it, there's six weeks of, of six modules that are spread out over six weeks, but there's six months worth of material in this course. And it gives you all of the information that you need. Um, so if you want to go to transforminganxiety.com slash mental health, that would be, um, that's the webinar. I'll that's the, it. yeah, that's the webinar. So they can just sign up for that and uh, learn more, but, and then learn more about the course as well, but just join the conversation, join us, come in and talk about mental health and learn some more. And um, even if you don't end up uh, going the, the, on the journey of getting the course, you can still participate and learn more about um, how to transform your anxiety because it's definitely possible. It definitely is possible. And that's what I really want to emphasize today that Treating, getting control over your anxiety is manageable, it's possible, and it's something that all of us can do. We shouldn't suffer. There's so many amazing strategies that are available that can empower us, that can make us feel in control, and that can help us regain control of our lives. I know that it really helped me not live in fear, and I really am motivated to help other people not live in fear or not live with anxiety, with the debilitating symptoms of anxiety either. I love it. I actually really appreciate some things you said today for my own kind of reframe. Um, Cause I think there is that there's a tendency to, ang to anxiety. I, I actually think I, I like, I I'm noticing <laughs> that I kind of pick partners who don't have like an overactive brain. Cause I really like need it to balance me out. Um, so it, it is a tendency and it's a tendency we can beat ourselves up about. I do anyway. Um, but as I learn, I'm like, okay, like I can talk to the voice in my head or I can stop and breathe. Or I, got, I was really mad the other day and I'm like, okay, what, what, what I, I've been doing a lot of work. So I'm like, what am, what mad, what am I mad about really? Like what need am I having that isn't met? And like this other person doesn't have to meet that need. Like how can I meet that need? So it's just been really good for me to learn that we all, all, our, all our brains work differently. And if you have a brain that tends to be somewhere in this anxious spectrum, there's, there are so many tools that you have at your disposal. So it's not like just controlling you. It's the worst feeling when you feel like you're having an anxious day that's just like controlling your whole day. It's no way to live. Well, I'm glad you said that about the partners because a lot of people with OCD and anxiety or an overanxious brain tend to choose partners partners that are the opposite, that are calm and, and more certain and reliable. I always tell my patients that have severe anxiety, find a partner that's, that's consistent and reliable, somebody that says what they mean and means what they say, and that they actually are um, balancing you out because that's what calms your anxiety. That's going to help you feel better. 
And so, yeah, there's a reason you're attracted to those partners because they calm your anxiety. You don't need somebody that's just as anxious as you are. But I also want to say, uh, this is something that I've told all of my patients, having an over anxious brain, as far as disorders go, it's the best disorder to have, honestly. <laughs> It is because people with overanxious brains are very successful. They're achievement oriented. They're detail oriented. They're conscientious. They are the things that society rewards. The problem is you're doing all of that because anxiety is fueling you. But if you can control that anxiety and understand that anxiety, then you can make it work for you and you can be unstoppable. It's like right now, if you don't understand it, you're on a runaway bus and the toddler's driving the bus. But if you realize you're like, wait a minute, this is a great bus. We're going on a really awesome trip. I'm going to get from the back of that bus and I'm bouncing around. I'm going to force my way up to the front of the bus. I'm going to drive this bus myself. Once you learn how to drive that bus, it can be the biggest gift. It can be the biggest blessing if you know what you're doing with it. Oh, I love that too. I feel like that's just, I'm 46. I'm just learning that. Cause yeah, I used to be so driven, but it was sort of out of a need not conscious need just to like kind of prove myself for something. But now I'm like, okay, like let's choose what we put our energy into. Cause I also know what it's like to like, you know, drive that bus into a wall. <laughs> like, you know, you can't drive that bus forever. You're going to burn out. Um, so yeah, I love that, that reframe of like, yeah, use, use that focus towards something that's healthy for you. And, and is like a healthy goal for you and your family rather than like, putting that energy just like wherever it leads you. So thank you so much. I'm so happy to be happy to have you on. Sorry, what, what, did I cut you off? Do you want to no. share? No, I just, uh, just wanted to just again, stress the fact that if you know what you're doing and you know that this is a gift and you can focus on healing it and working with it instead of constantly fighting it. Like even somebody that has a super clean house, if you're choosing to have a super clean house because it makes you feel good and it's meditative, great. But if you're doing it because you're afraid of what people are going to say and it has to be perfect because the world is going to open up and swallow you whole, if it's not, that's anxiety. You got to manage it. Mm, yeah. You know, I've had so many people tell me over the years, oh, you're, you're sensitive and that's, that's a gift. And I'm like, mm, doesn't feel like one, but I think it just takes time to manage. Yeah. To learn like how, where to put your energy and, and yeah, what, how, how you label it so that it does feel like a gift and you know, like nobody can kind of like take that away from you because you know how to manage it yourself. So I really appreciate one it. One thing I just, Go ahead. thank you. I just really quickly, one thing I, I just read was being sensitive. Yeah, we feel everything and we can react to it, but we also feel happiness for the littlest things as well. We might react to the negative little things, but we also react positively to the little positive things too. So that's, mm. that, that's how it could be a gift. That's the one flip side. Okay, awesome. So I put the I put the um, link to the webinar in the Zoom. So I'll have to run over and put it in Facebook too. And then as always, we always put these interviews in YouTube later. So if you want to share it with a friend later, or you're like, what did she say about that? Um, we post it to our YouTube channel, usually within 24 hours. So you can always go back and find something you want to revisit. Well, thank you everyone for being on here live. Um, we are, I don't think we're having something Thursday because we did this today. Um, and then we are, oh, next Thursday, we'll be back on talking about oral health, which is actually one of the most popular topics in our audience. People are so curious about holistic oral health. So we're bringing on a holistic dental hygienist to talk about the oral microbiome, which can mess up your gut microbiome and create a lot of stress on your body. So that one will be on the 13th. So we'll see you all then. And thank you so much for being here, everyone.